So we're working with the human subtle energy field that science is recently starting to call the bio field. There is a field of energies, mostly electromagnetic. Well, martial arts have been more of my life than it hasn't. I got started in 1968. I'm a first and second generation karate do teacher. First generation because I studied with uh, men who came back from Okinawa who had studied with some of the Okinawan masters. Second generation because I studied with some of those teachers' teachers. Uh, I'm in my 52nd year of um, studying Okinawan karate. I am the current successor of the Ishin Kempo system. I'm a, a Buddhist monk. I often go by my Buddhist name, Hayashi Tomio, in martial circles. I tend to prefer that name, but I was born Christopher John Gertica. That extends about a foot to a foot and a half around someone who's relatively healthy, rested, and stress-free. Right? The field actually goes indefinitely in all directions, but it's concentrated within that foot and a half. I also have a field, and when our fields are next to each other close enough, my field will alter his field and vice versa. Um, I personally find that there was a lot that was not shared, not conveyed in terms of traditional kata. Now, I'm a traditional karate teacher. In fact, I would even say I'm a traditional karate do teacher. And in my writings, I've uh, tried to highlight the distinction. If you're just studying your martial art purely for the technique of it, and you're not involving yourself in embracing a wider philosophy that could um, enhance your everyday life, then you're not studying Karate Do. Karate Do is um, martial arts outside of the dojo. That is, you take your martial art principles, maybe even your techniques, outside of the dojo. Um, Kata has basically been my forte since the beginning. People have asked me, why did I get involved in karate in the first place? It wasn't because I was being bullied or picked on. It wasn't because I felt a lack of confidence in my person. Um, I just found the potency and the power that I saw expressed in these arts um, so compelling that um, I just had to do it. Uh, I have to say that from my first karate experience, my first formal class, which was December 12th, 1968, and I don't usually remember dates, but for some reason that's a date that goes down in the infamy of my life, um, I saw one of the uh, sensei get up and perform a, a twist punch with a crisp gi, and from that point on, I was hooked completely. I had to do the art. If somebody had whispered in my ear back then when I was a tall, gangly teenager, I'm still tall and gangly, by the way, but I'm not a teenager anymore, and it said to me, look, someday you're going to outlast your own sensei. You're going to take over his system. You're going to uh, have, make inroads into aspects of um, karate kata, karate art, um, uh, beyond most people, I would have said, oh, I don't know if that's going to happen. That would be uh, too great of a dream come true. Well, that dream has come true. I have learned more than I ever expected. I personally have found that my martial education was equal, if not superior, to my academic education. I'm a college graduate. I uh, have a degree in uh, business from Fairfield University. In my um, group of uh, students and peers, uh, we're having some really extraordinary conversations about the uh, direction of these arts today and uh, their potential. Um, I have uh, spent over the last 25 years a very deep study into what I'm referring to as Kiko which is the internal side of, um, of the Karate Do arts. Again, I make a distinction between the Karate and the Karate Do. One is just the physical technique, 
and the other is going deeper into the metaphysics, into the psychological side, into the emotional components, and uh, into the internal energy cultivation that we find in the umbrella term Kiko. Uh, my uh, primary focus, probably since the beginning of my training, has been kata. I am fascinated by kata. I can say uh, definitively that we did not get the full dimensionality of uh, kata as it went from Okinawa uh, to the Western cultures. There's far, far more in these kata than even uh, what I'm seeing some of the cutting edge kata performers talking about. And by that, uh, when I'm referring to Kiko, I really mean um, that there has been embedded into kata some principles that are not only not commonly understood, but principles that are not even understood by the uncommon practitioners. Uh, what exactly am I referring to? Well, uh, if we look at some of the internal styles out of China, for example, uh, Tai Chi being one of the more popular mainstream ones, uh, Xing Yi and Bagua, we see um, a focus on the performance of the katas, not just on the overt um, uh, performance, but on a covert performance, on an uh, integration that's going on behind the obvious. When you're performing a kata, in some of the better schools, you'll actually see specific breathing patterns being introduced into the forms um, with certain movements, movement sets, or individual techniques. Um, we find that if the breath is not just out of sync, but improperly chosen, for example, an exhalation versus an inhalation, katas can be performed uh, a variety of different ways, but if the respiratory process is not in sync with the energy flow, you don't get anywhere near the kind of physical strength that you want to have in these techniques when you're performing them. Um, I use the term ki ko, which translates literally as spirit breath, um, perhaps more precisely in terms of energy movement. Uh, here, respiration isn't just about the uh, flow of air coming in and out of you, but about a tidal flow of energy that moves through the body in very specific channels that have been delineated by the Chinese through their traditional Chinese medical practices, specifically uh, acupuncture and uh, Qigong. On Okinawa, there were masters practicing martial Qigong. They would have practiced under a different name than Qigong. Kiko is an old world term terminology that was probably used by these practitioners uh, in their understanding of these covert um, techniques. Uh, chinkuchi or chinku, uh, chinkuchi is another term that you will hear uh, treated to internal practices. However, years ago, I had um, an interesting uh, dialogue with a, um, a highly regarded Gojuru master and uh, Tenth Don in Ishinru. Um, Caucasian named Frank Van Lenten. Uh, Sensei Van Lenten has since passed away. Uh, he and I, at the time, engaged in a conversation about Chinkuchi, in which he shared with me um, some writings that he'd been putting together for his own students. And when I read the brief overview of his idea of Chinkuchi, I realized that though we were in the same um, uh, arena, we're at very, very different sides of that arena. My understanding of Chinkuchi was almost a 180 degree difference from his understanding. He saw it as a certain type of physical training involving weights that could give you greater uh, potency in your techniques, whereas I saw it as a particular way to move that in detail went much deeper than the average mainstream karate student 
is performing today. The uh, kata that epitomizes Kiko practice is, of course, San Chin. And there are different variations of San Chin, older world variations, um, more modified versions. Uh, in fact, I'd make a, a, a general statement that when we look at the history of karate, karate kata, going from, say, the early 1900s to today, uh, I can say that there's been a continued modifying process taking place through individual schools and the uh, personal eccentricities of different teachers, uh, misunderstandings, misinterpretations of the way the katas were being taught. And uh, those teachers themselves also, um, rather than staying fixed to one way of performing the kata, themselves changing the kata as they evolved deeper understandings about their own art. Um, I have a very uh, deep understanding of the Ishinru kata. Uh, that has been my base study for a very long time, but it began to spill over into other styles as I speak with other professionals. Um, so whether they're hard or soft styles, I'm now seeing the underlying platform of Kiko moving through a lot of these traditional forms. If you look at the average lifespan of an Okinawan back in the 18th century, most did not live or were considered old by the age of 40 to 45. That would be their lifespan. If you look at the average lifespan of people today in Western cultures, we're starting to push those upper limits of the 70s and into the 80s. And of course, if you have a good genetic structure, you can go a lot further. So we have professional martial artists now who are spending more than the entire lifespan of an Okinawan studying karate. I would be a good example because I've been studying karate for, um, I'm in my 52nd year, so that's over a half a century now. As a novice practitioner in my teens, I, I didn't really have a good sense of study. I was a practitioner of karate. I practiced what was told to me. I didn't really study. And I would like to make a distinction between practice and study. You know, practice is the rote performance of a technique. You're taught a front kick, a back kick, a side kick, a back fist. You're taught a taikyoku. You're taught a, a short form. You're taught san chin. And you just, you just rote perform those the way your teacher has asked you to do it. If you're fortunate, you get bunkai where you can start to apply it and then work out some of the intuitive nuances that you might not see if you're just doing the kata and never working with a partner. Um, when I talk about study, I'm really talking about perhaps a challenge to why is the move done this way? Is there a better way it could be performed? And if there's a better way, or if there are multiple better ways, why was this one chosen over that one? And this is where the katas become very interesting because you can take a kata like Cezanne and you can find maybe five major variants of it. Some people start with the left foot forward, some people start with the right foot forward, some people do double blocks, some people only do that first single block. Uh, breathing is almost rarely touched upon, at least if you go on YouTube and you want to look at a bunch of Cezannes, you won't really hear much discussed in terms of why the katas are doing a particular way. 90% of the videos you look at are really just asking you to rote perform the kata. Well, my study took a big turn, probably a good 10, maybe even 20 years in, um, to challenge why those movements were done the, the way they were done. And if we look at Cezanne kata, why is, does the opening movement in the Ishinru version start with the left foot forward and not the right foot forward? And would it make a difference? Now, there are those practitioners who are steeped well in bunkai who might say it's all bunkai dependent. But I would take the position that most of us are going to spend more time 
practicing a kata solo than we are with a partner. And when we're practicing the kata solo, the question might come up is, is there an ideal way to perform a kata solo versus practicing with a partner? And the answer is probably there is, because when you're engaged with another person, there's a new dynamic that enters in. It's not just the different size or shape or level of intelligence or body dynamic of the other person. That's important. It's also the energetic orientation of that person. Energy fields are intermingling with each other, engaging with each other before two players even make contact. We've proven many, many times that one's uh, partner can have his physical strength affected simply by the manner in which you choose to enter into the technique. I will tell you there's an entire art, which we could call the art of entering, that will aid you in being successful with any type of technique. Well, take, take a grappling technique, for example. Let's suppose you have the opportunity to grab your opponent's wrist and uh, put him in a wrist takedown. Different schools engage that hand once they get hold of it in different ways. In Aikido, there might be an open hand and a thumb holding the back of the wrist. There might be fingers pressed to the inside, the eye of the palm to bring your opponent down. What I'm suggesting is that in the art of entry, before I even touch my opponent, how I go towards that hand is uh, from a Kiko standpoint, either adding energy to or taking energy away from somebody. I could come down, I could come up, I could come straight in, I could close in like a vice. Those three methods are going to make a big difference. Now, Kiko takes advantage of the ability that we have both mentally and physically to alter these fields. When you think of typical physical gestures, a gesture like this, there's an intuitive sense that this is a receiving gesture. Right? It looks like I'm asking for something or I want you to give me something. When you see a gesture like this, it seems to be some type of stay away, extending or transmitting gesture. Let's take a look at just these gestures without any other event going on. And it's a potential effect on someone's physical strength. So I'm gonna ask Brian to hold his wrist out now, in martial arts, there is a typical wrist technique in which you come up and you grab the hand. There's different styles, have different ways of holding onto the hand. And he's going to allow me to do this. And you take them down to the ground in a wrist technique. Very simple move. There are tricks, by the way, to bring somebody down. I'm just going to take his hand and try to twist it so we get a general strength idea. How strong is he resisting me? I might be stronger than him, that's fine. So I hold his wrist up. I'm not doing any Kiko. I'm not, I'm not going to grab any spe spe specific way that's going to alter his strength. I'm going to try to twist. He's going to try to resist, and he's pretty strong without me doing something. Let's look at what happens if I take a gesture like this receiving gesture. He's going to do everything he just did the same. He's not changing anything. And I'm just going to hold my hands here. I have no intention. All I want to do is hold my hands out. I wasn't really even trying that hard. Let's take a look. The most common method is physical postures and the movement into and out of certain postures will cause, when I'm in proximity to him, a weakening or a strengthening of his musculature and a weakening or strengthening of my own musculature. I can either draw from him with receiving postures. Not so easy when you look at a kata. This could be a receiving posture you see in Sayuchin. If I stand in a Sayuchin stance and Brian's wrist is out, he goes right down. If I were to stand in ascending posture, he'll stay right back up again. This is essentially how Kiko is working. We are manipulating an energy field that we believe is primarily electromagnetic 
We are altering the electromagnetic frequency, which is in effect causing his muscles to either strengthen or weaken. And so the covert practice is looking deeply at kata, beginning with a questioning of, is this the ideal method? How could someone have arrived at it? Are there other methods that hold equal value? Is there a way in which we could substantiate that value and be able to say definitively that that performance, although it works because the opponent doesn't have the superior skills to overcome it, is it's in itself a mediocre technique, whereas this application is a more superior technique and will work against a superior opponent. The average martial artist in the United States isn't really going to go past two and a half tops, absolutely tops, five years of training in any particular martial art. When you get to the 10-year mark, you're really talking about a very, very thin group of practitioners. Go to 25, 30, 40, or 50 in my case, and you're talking about maybe one-tenth of one percent of the world's population of martial art practitioners will ever have the opportunity to penetrate the art to that particular depth. Uh, longevity doesn't necessarily mean you're penetrating your art deeply. But for those of us that are very open-minded, we're still questioning, we're still curious, chances are you will go a lot deeper in the art. So what I'm seeing in kata isn't necessarily what even some of the 10-year and 20-year instructors are seeing in kata. Some perhaps have crossed over into the Kiko territory. Many, however, from my personal experience talking with them, have not. They're unaware of this level of technique. Uh, should this be something introduced to beginners? Well, in soft style schools or internal schools, internal principles are taught along with the external principles. In um, hard style schools, they're usually not even known, so they can't be taught if they're not known. And the focus might just be a little bit different because you have a lot of people coming in with the, either the idea they'd like to get their belts so they can put it on their college essay, or um, uh, they want to go into competition. They have very, very specific focus. Uh, as I've said before, when we look at karate do versus karate, uh, we are looking at uh, two ends of a spectrum, uh, where one end of the spectrum is focusing on the narrow goal. That doesn't mean that the goal, by the way, is less valuable for that individual. It could be extremely valuable if you are a martial competitor and you enjoy competing. Um, and that's all you're into the art for, I'm not going to knock it. I think it's great. I'm happy that we have all of these different uh, potential avenues for all kinds of martial artists. I mean, can you imagine? Well, well actually, I'll give you an example. In uh, uh, the early to late 1960s, it was very rare for a karate dojo to take in young children uh, under the age of seven. I'm not saying that there weren't some that did it, but it was very unusual. It wasn't for quite a few years later that we started to see an influx of very young children. And today, there are schools that are actually advertising they'll take children as young as one and a half years old. Um, can they learn the art in, um, in um, the manner in which an adult can learn it? No, absolutely not. They don't possess any of the maturity at all to go to that kind of depth. Should they? No, they're children. But these children are being exposed to martial-like exercises in the hopes that they will become uh, fully-fledged uh, martial artists as they grow older. So I, I, I'm open to all martial arts styles. I think they all have something of benefit to offer us. Uh, and I am not at all engaged with people who believe that their art's better than my art, um, because to me, those are just unhappy people. I like what I do. You like what you do. I'm not forcing you to do my way. I don't want you to force me to do your way. All these paths will lead you somewhere, and that's something personal with each individual that studies martial arts. You have to decide why you're in it in the first place, 
what you'd like to get out of it. Where I will step in is uh, asking students who do have the more narrow, but not less valuable, interest, if they'd like to peer to the left or the right of their current focus. As a Buddhist monk, <clears throat> in a martial arts system that was originally a bodyguard system, um, the idea behind training had its practical side, but also had uh, a different side, uh, a side that was a focus on the therapeutic to try to vitalize the body, to, to uh, enhance the body's um, overall well-being, and a meditative side to it. That is, there was an interest to use martial arts as a vehicle to help a person ground themselves better in their everyday life. This is why I say Karate Do is taking your principles out into the everyday world, your day-to-day -day dealings. I'm not talking about punching and kicking in your day-to-day -day dealings. I'm talking about being authentic, uh, being potent, being committed to that which you're desiring for yourself. And the martial arts can offer you some insights into how to optimize those desires. So for me, at my age right now, I'm less interested in competition. I am very happy if students are interested in competition. I wouldn't try to dissuade them from it. Uh, I also feel it's important that one avoid the negatives when it comes to martial artists or martial arts systems espousing they're better than one or another. Who cares? It's the one you're doing. In fact, until you're doing martial arts for some length of time, you really won't have enough insight into the nature of martial art practices in general to be able to determine one style's worth versus another style's worth. So if a person comes to me and says, well, I'd really like a style that has some uh, pressure points in it uh, or more competition um, or more meditation or more aerobic value, uh, my uh, response to them is, I offer a complete system. Uh, it will take decades to become a master of this system, but the product of your engagement with this system will absolutely lead to a more fulfilling life. This is why I do it. This is why I teach it. It's offered me those values, and so I'm offering those values in return to people that would like to study. Um, of course, on the spectator side of the arts, in order to generate income for those spectator sports, you're always going to see a certain amount of hype that's going to agitate one group uh, over the next so that everybody can get excited to see which group is going to dominate. But here again, from a philosophical standpoint, we have this very lopsided idea about winners and losers. If you get the best martial artist in the world, the best martial art competitor in the world, and he defeats uh, in a high-level match another one, uh, member, uh, martial artist who wanted to challenge him, we have a winner and we have a loser, but you know that loser is pretty damn good. I don't see it particularly in terms of winning and losing. I see two people coming out trying the best to express their systems. And, uh, and we have two great competitors, if they're, if they're good, grounded competitors, uh, demonstrating the possibilities that we see in the arts. So for me, as a traditional karate do practitioner, I'm doing the same type of thing, um, but I'm doing it with the methodologies that have been taught to me and that I've acquired after those teachings through my own practices. And uh, one of the primary methodologies is kata. Now, if we look at traditional martial arts, we see that the uh, three foundational practices in traditional arts are the kata, the kumite, and the bunkai. That is, we have the solo practice, you with yourself, doing these forms, trying to get them as perfected as possible. We have your bunkai, which is kind of, um, I think of it as um, uh, rehearsing success. You work with a partner until you get those movements down where they're near flawless. 
And then we put it in a real time situation where anything goes in a Ju Kumite, a free exchange with your opponent. Those three represent a kind of microcosm of what the real world is like, right? There's your desires, which are yours in your own head and you're trying to play it out. Maybe you rehearse that with friends of yours. For example, you're gonna go off and uh, uh, you've gotta find a new job. You're putting your resume together. You're going through some uh, rehearsals with friends to make sure that your responses, should you get an interview, are going to be tight responses. And then you actually go off to the interview and you hope you get the job. There's a lot of examples like that. This is, this is where the Do comes in, where the way of karate, you'll hear people talk about karate as a way of life. Well, in the dojo, it's a way of life in the dojo. That is, you come in with your karate gi, you get onto the mat, you do your warm-ups, you work with your students, you go through your katas, whatever your teacher is directing you, directing you to do, and uh, that's your Do. When you leave the mat and you take off your gi and you go home and you're with your family, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, you're out in your community, you're engaged in the same way you can take those principles and bring them into the everyday. Um, and this is where the walls of the dojo fall away. And you take those principles of efficiency, you take those principles of commitment, into those everyday moments. You apply yourself, you try to be present, you try to be mindful. Practices that you cultivate when you're in the dojo can now be practiced outside and, in, and actually um, unfold outside. Well, let me go back to kata again for a little bit since it's a topic that I enjoy. When I say that even uh, young professional uh, karate sensei are unaware of the, is unaware of the kiko nature of kata. Um, because karate in Western cultures was adopted for its uh, obvious um, uh, vitality, dynamism, we overlooked the, the basic structure of the forms. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about kihon or basics, that's different, but there, I could comment on basics. There's something also interesting there. It's that the katas are unique. They're uniquely constructed. They're not informational sequences just about bunkai. They're informational sequences about how energy moves through the body. Now, the Chinese will call this energy qi or qi. Uh, Japanese will call it qi. Uh, um, we can talk about qi or qi as this energy, but this energy can't be limited to just one type of energy, like um, electromagnetic. It, it's an, it involves electromagnetism. It involves sound waves. It involves photons or light particles. And I believe in the not too distant future, we're going to see a new kind of language emerging to describe some of our practices. We're pretty far off from this. I like to think I'm in part in the avant-garde of this uh, coming out, but we're going to see a new language as science has started to uh, understand the nature of what the Chinese refer to as qi or qi. Now, I think of qi or qi as an umbrella term for subtle energy influences that up until very recently have fallen outside of biomechanical understanding. When you're performing a kata, there's some very obvious biomechanics no matter whether you're studying a Chinese form or a Korean form or a Japanese form or other countries' uh, indigenous arts, uh, the biomechanics are obvious in, in the sense that if you see somebody in a wide, low, deep kibidachi, a horse stance, uh, you know that that stance is very resistant from the sides to pushes and pulls. What is less known or unknown is that if we look more deeply 
at these postures, we can see something like a horse stance is also causing energies through the meridian channels to move differently than if you were standing normally. If you understand why they're moving differently or how they're moving differently, you can apply that difference in an engagement with another person in terms of, say, kata bunkai. So kata stances are not arbitrary. For example, you're standing in a kibadachi, which should have your feet straight, and a sensei says, well, it doesn't matter as long as your feet are wide enough so your feet can be turned out or maybe rotated slightly inward. This would be a mistake because stances, and this also includes hand postures, are causing um, uh, very dynamic energetic shifts in your meridian system, which is going to have an effect on your strength when you engage yourself with your bunkai. So, looking at kata from the internal side, we see subtle energies having a sophisticated composition in traditional kata. Let me try to rephrase that again. When you see a traditional kata pattern, regardless of what system you're studying, whether you are aware of this or not, whether you're a sensei or shifu is aware of this or not, there is another level of information being conveyed, specifically in the essential kata, and I can speak uh, for sure about the essential kata of Okinawa, that wants you to understand if the left foot is stepping forward, into a Cezanne Dachi, and you're doing a left middle block, it most likely will not be able to be performed with the same degree of success if you're doing it with a right foot forward and a right middle block. Now, I know if a sensei, if you're a sensei and you're listening to this and you go off and you apply your middle block with the right or the left, you'll probably be very effective at defending against strikes coming at you, and you'll turn around and say, I don't see it, it's not there. However, I disagree. If you were here standing across from me, I'm pretty sure that I can show you it does make a difference. But you wouldn't know that until you start breaking these movements down, looking specifically at these strength increases. So, I, I have always enjoyed the uh, insights of an Okinawan master of Shurenru notoriety, Shoshin Nagamine, who, I've stated this many times, has said, if you're not doing kata, you're not doing karate. Karate is what we, the Okinawans, are giving to you, the Western culture. I absolutely agree with that. He should have added, but we're not going to give you that secondary esoteric manual that's going to show you just how deep kata can go. This has been a huge frustration for Western martial artists. First of all, not only did we have a language barrier when the Western world was studying with these Eastern uh, masters. Uh, but we also had a complete lack of awareness that there was this other level, this deeper level to the nature of form work or kata practice. So we couldn't even ask questions about it. We wouldn't even have known what to ask. Western culture, um, for example, did not see the effectiveness of acupuncture, didn't believe it. It seemed like some kind of voodoo or magic practice to stick needles in people and heal them of various ailments or uh, speed up their injuries. Okay, that's been turned around. Um, so we didn't know what to ask. 
and we were left with the obvious. Now, there are people who feel that after World War II in Okinawa, because of the devastation that was wreaked upon the Okinawan people by um, the Allied forces, there was no interest uh, on the part of those masters that survived the war to teach anything deeper than their basic Karate 101. <clears throat> you did have a lot of uh, returning servicemen who had studied with these masters in the 1950s, went back 60s, 70s, 80s, and they were able to penetrate into some of this material, but very, very few of them. Um, so we had hurdles to get over, and we still have quite a lot of hurdles to get over. I've come across uh, quite a number of martial artists who don't believe in chi, don't believe it exists at all. Um, rather than have that debate here in this particular video, I'm happy to discuss uh, my observations and research with anybody who cares to contact me. I have heard a lot of people fluff up and want to challenge me about this information, but nobody's actually come over here to talk about it. I'm more than happy to talk about it and to uh, demonstrate it. So um, we see the greatest evidence in, of Kiko in the katas by the manner in which they're constructed. Um, when you, when, well, let me just comment about a central kata here. So I don't believe that all kata are essential. And um, I say that because I think we saw in Okinawa as the Japanese were drawing most of the attention in uh, the 1920s away from Okinawa, as the karate was popular in Japan, um, you, you saw the introduction of more kata rather than less kata coming into these arts. So, if you've read anything in the history of some of these um, kata arts, you'll see that the further back you go, the fewer the kata were practiced. If you were to look at the level of nuance that uh, I'm teaching in forms for my senior students, many of them with me for 30 plus years, um, you can understand why it would take 10 years minimum to be able to fully comprehend what's involved in any of these katas. Now, in Okinawa, and I'm speaking from my own Ishiro curriculum, um, we could say that uh, certainly Sanchin is an essential form, Nehanchi is an essential form, uh, Seizan is an essential form. The other katas are very good. They're, they're fairly tight in the Ishiro system, but um, um, the nuance was certainly lost as they came forward in time. So we have it close to uh, the mark but not exactly the mark. And it's like the telephone game. I teach you a kata, you leave and open up a dojo and teach your students a kata, and they leave and teach a kata. There's probably going to be some divergence of those techniques from my teaching to that uh, third generation teacher. And this is where we uh, often will find ourselves on a kind of sine wave where we're gaining insights and then something historically happens and we lose the insights and we come back up and we gain the insights and we lose the insights. If you haven't read the, the uh, book Spring Wind, you get a very clear picture in that book by David McCullough of this rise and fall of knowledge. And we're, we're seeing the same thing today, even amongst different schools. Uh, nobody really goes, uh, nobody's policing another dojo's um, uh, library of uh, technique or inventory of technique, but we would see some schools have a thinner inventory and some schools have a more comprehensive inventory of uh, technique. But for me, the issue isn't whether your inventory is uh, slim or broad, it's um, do you understand what you have in front of you? And if you don't, I would like to help you understand that you've got some extraordinary information packed into these sequences. Um, I suppose it's a little bit of a tease, but I would say something like this. When you look at Saison, which has three steps forward, and then it turns around and starts with three steps going in the other direction, we're pretty sure 
that with some of the katas, we have what is called in these change of directions, a polarity change. We have a switch from yang type energy to yin type energy. Um, and we could say something like this that you'll notice in, say, uh, Ishin Rose's on. You have a three step forward pattern where the hands are closed and you turn around, and you have a three step pattern where the hands are open, but it's done with the opposite foot. This is not by um, just happen chance. This was very consciously put into those forms. Somebody knew something about the nature of uh, energy flow through the meridians. Somebody had a very, very clear sense of the way chi moves through the body, not just through the body, but how chi can be used to accentuate your own individual technique. And that's just, uh, that's just a very base observation about the Kiko influence in the forms. You know, they say the devil is in the details. Um, my uh, statement to my students is, how much detail do you want? because there's no ceiling. You, don't, you only reach an end because you choose to reach an end in your study. There is no actual ceiling. Um, one of my uh, Buddhist peers, Arakawa Tomio, uh, once said, if I only had three lifetimes, three lifetimes, maybe I could really get to, her, to, the, to the bottom of all this. But I suspect there is no bottom to any of it. If you're enthused about your art, which I am, and I have to say something about this too. You know, my enthusiasm for karate study is as alive today as it was when I first started as a teenager. And I consider myself to be extremely fortunate. And um, it fully engages me day to day. Even if I don't have students, I'm so excited about the potential that I see inherent in the forms and that continually offers deeper and more profound insights, not just about the art in general, but about my life and um, how I can live that life to the fullest possible. So I go back and say, you know, everybody has a particular interest for getting involved in martial arts. That interest can change what you thought was your path in the first year might become very different the second year. And certainly as the decades go by, to be able to, to sustain your enthusiasm for your martial arts is, can, can be challenging for some people. Um, so I'm very fortunate that my enthusiasm is as high, and maybe, maybe it's even higher than it was, because um, I see so much there. If any of this conversation has been interesting to you, um, if it's a dialogue you would like to uh, continue, I'm certainly open to talk with any of you and to share my ideas um, and insights about the Kiko nature of forms, regardless of your system. Um, thanks for listening.